what are your thoughts on you know on AI in general and you know just kind of bringing it into the, the finance function? So I mean, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, I definitely think that it's going to make a significant impact in a lot of different areas within the business, including finance. Welcome to the Financial Innovations Podcast, helping CFOs save money and time by implementing cutting edge technology. We have a lot of great topics to talk about today. We'll talk about AI. We're going to talk about putting the right guardrails in place, change management, um, as well as uh, general uh, technology to implement. We're really excited to have Chantel Vessels on the call here today. Chantel, great to see you. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so, you know, we have a lot of uh, great topics to talk through uh, over here. Uh, do you want to start by just giving a quick introduction of, of yourself and we can uh, dive right in? Yeah, I can start. So I'm the Chief Financial Officer at um, Apex Fintech Solutions. Um, so Apex Fintech Solutions is really kind of powering the back end of the financial technology universe as we know it today so we've definitely seen a massive ramp up since 2020 around retail investing and just accessing various financial technologies so we do all the kind of guts and the plumbing on the on the back end of that that enables these financial technology firms to to operate um very very exciting place to be a lot of growth a lot of potential for the company to really accelerate over the next couple of years um, only I've been, I've been here for around six months now, um, but it's been an incredible journey so far. Yeah, no, that's great. And, you know, I know, especially in the, the fintech space over there, um, you know, it, it's exciting because, um, you know, you guys uh, implement and, and uh, experiment with a lot of different types of technology. And um, I, I worked with a, a similar company back in the past. And, you know, the, that's kind of where some of the, the bigger transformation types of journeys and, and opportunities were so you know it's great to uh to be speaking to someone that you know is is in a, a similar type of field over there so i guess uh as we go in you know in terms of you know technologies like what what technologies have you found to be you know really helpful to in invest in and uh, implement yeah um, so I'll speak from a finance standpoint specifically because that's that's where I've spent most of my time. Um, I think it depends around where the company is in their journey, right? So, you know, companies that are in the beginning of their journeys need to probably have a lot more simplified type of technology stacks to just do the bare minimum where, you know, as companies grow and become bigger, they need to have much more complicated, I would say, technology stacks, because there's a lot more activities and a lot more processes that involve sometimes too much manual work. And, you know, replacing that manual work with then technology really kind of helps that company achieve a lot of cost efficiencies if, they, if they're bigger and scalable. On the, on the smaller company side, it's really just understanding and building that foundation and understanding what the need is to just operate effectively and then over time be able to then scale um, to you know, a place or a position where you can actually implement bigger technology stacks. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's a really important point for organizations to really take away from this because um, t way too often I see somebody saying, hey, we've got to just put dashboards in here because everyone is, you know, dashboard is the word of the day. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's, you know, and, and they're kind of discounting the fact of our dashboards right for me in this situation. Yes, a competitor might be, you know, using dashboards, but that doesn't necessarily mean that at this point in time, you know, I should be doing it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I also like a lot of that is just, the underlying data set and the accuracy of the underlying data sets, right? So you can have the most beautiful dashboards out there and it can, you know, spit out awesome things. But if the underlying data sets aren't the correct data sets, it doesn't matter what technology you implement, regardless of size of firm. Um, it just, you know, it's almost a bit of a waste of time. So it is really just how mature the businesses are in terms of their 
of their ability to, I would say, almost audit their data or just have some data governance around it. You don't have to be a 200 you know, two hundred million dollar firm, or versus a five million dollar firm, just in terms of making sure that you have data governance. I don't think size matters there, but just having that foundation set up is is so important. And then, whatever technology that you put on top of that, then needs to be helpful for you, rather than to I would say solve problems. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I that I do find with people implement technology because they think it's going to solve all their problems. It's not the case. You know, technology is really supposed to provide you with efficient ways to do things, to provide you with a lot more insights and, and things like that. So that, that's an important piece to remember as well. Yeah. And, and it, you know, a common thing I hear from especially smaller kinds of companies of, oh, if we only had the same budget that a giant company had, all our problems would be solved. Right. And, and, and as you, uh, go into and and look at some of those bigger companies. Yes, they may have better, bigger budgets, but are they spending it effectively? Is the, to your point, is the underlying data good? And do they have the right foundation in place? So uh, I I guess a a common question that I hear all the time is, well, you know, like, what does that foundation look like? Because I see a lot of companies, they spend probably too much time building the foundation where nothing ever, you know, they, they can never use the data because they don't have a, a, a really a way of being able to access it because they've just put all their investment in building, you know, database tables and structures and this and that. And then you have the opposite end of the spectrum of, you know, people have all the bells and whistles and all the fancy technology, but, you know, uh, it's questionable in terms of whether or not it can be used for financial statements. So, you know, kind of how do you, how do you, kind of strike that balance. Yeah. So the one thing I, I would say, though, it, it doesn't really matter how big the company is, there's always going to be budget constraints around implementing systems. So I've worked in many different companies and it's the same issue all around. I think sometimes what happens is that the more money people do have, they implement too many systems and then you have all these other costs to actually like, like manage the systems. But coming back to your earlier point, just in terms of what foundation is necessary, I mean, at the end of the day, you actually just need to understand what is the outcome that you want to achieve, you know, and what is the easiest way you're going to achieve that outcome. Um, if you if you overcomplicate it by saying, all right, starting from the beginning, working to the end, I think things get a lot of a lot of complications happen with that. Like people try and implement too many things and they try and implement it too fast or they don't implement anything at all to your point, right? So it's really trying to understand, okay, what is it that I want to get to at the end of this? And if I had to take a step back and, you know, work backwards in terms of what does my baseline need to look like to be able to, to achieve that outcome, that differs for every single company. But it's always good to, start with a vision because then people are more eager to start implementing things because they know what they're trying to reach and what they're trying to achieve rather than say, we're going to implement this new system, you know, and, you know, we need you guys to spend a whole bunch of time making sure that your data sets are correct and that type of thing. So we implementing the system rather than we want to be able to provide all these additional insights to the business in terms of how much you're selling, which customers should you go go after? Who are the type of investors that's investing in you? You know, that's going to be important for us because that's really going to add value to the company. So what is it that we need to do to be able to get really reliable information so that we get these insights? Oh, we need to understand, you know, the pricing. You know, we need to start with our contracts. We need to make sure that our contracts are right. We need to make sure that the pricing feeds in some way. We need to make sure that we understand who our customers are and all of these things need to tie together to then be able to get to that end game and, and the outcome. Yeah, th- those are great points because I-, I feel like especially in today's day and age, right, everyone puts, uh, or I shouldn't say everyone, it's a blanket statement, but a lot of companies put uh, heavy um, pressure on, you know, we want to do this, we want to be agile, we want to get this done as quickly as possible. And, you know, a lot of uh, shortcuts are taken in terms of, you know, making sure that not only do you have a vision, but are all the stakeholders aware of what that vision is? Is everyone bought into the vision? Does everyone know what part they play in that? And, you know, by shortcutting and skipping some of those steps, you know, you get to a point where, 
um, you know, you're, you have a lot of people hurrying up to build something and nobody knows what it is they're, they're building. Right. And, and then later on you realize, oh, wait a second. Uh, you know, we, we built something, but it wasn't anything like what we were, we were supposed to do. Exactly. Yeah. A hundred percent. So I guess when, when you're thinking about and, and kind of crafting that vision of, you know, here's what we want to be able to do, who, who do you typically involve in that? So I do think that depending on, you know, what, what type of system it is that you want to implement or what, you know, whether it is an ERP system or whether it is um, a financial planning system, um, getting buy-in from the, you know, the right stakeholders is, is vitally important. Um, so, you know, from an ERP standpoint, it's generally the finance organization plus then their business partners because they all have an impact in terms of what the numbers look like. And the same on the financial planning and analysis and business insights. You, you know, you have a kind of group of people within the finance organization, but then also your business partners, depending on, you know, whether it is business partners driving revenues or whether it is business partners on the legal side from a data and governance standpoint. But I have found that a lot of the implementations that I've been a part of, the fundamental piece or the fundamental point of failure is not involving the right people and just assuming, okay, you know, this is a finance system. It's only going to be done by finance. We're going to make all the decisions. And then when you actually get to, to implementing it and rolling it out, the amount of resistance that you then get from the rest of the organization is insane because they actually have some kind of stake or skin in the game in terms of just being getting information out of that system or you know just being involved in it in some way or form so i do think that it's not just you have to be very careful around making sure that you invite the right people um as part of the entire project yeah i mean that that's a really good point and you know and and it's it it Everyone wants to kind of keep things as small as possible in terms of groups, uh, you know, not having too many cooks in the kitchen. But, you know, I think more than that, where projects go wrong, it's the the opposite of, you know, having too few people and not involving the right people. So it's it's a matter of making sure that you have the right people on board, understanding what is the goal? Who do I have to have? And, you know, more often than not, you'll have, you know, IT involved where, you know, the, I'm sure you know, in most organizations, they're playing some sort of role supporting the technology after it's implemented. Um, to your point of, you know, does legal need to uh, look at this? Do we have a cybersecurity team that needs to look at this to make sure that, um, you know, that we're going through? And, and you know, and, and a lot of that, too, is going to factor in, are we cloud? Are we on-premise? You know, who has our data? You know, all, all those types of things. So, you know, just kind of, um, you know, brings to light that, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, your, your team is large enough that you're cut it, covering all the bases, but, you know, kind of focused enough that, you know, you're not necessarily having too many uh, people, um, you know, providing their input on, on what, what it is that, that you want to do. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree with you. And I think the one thing that I've also seen is how people underestimate the importance of change management when going through these implementations, right? So if you get a, a proposal, generally what the proposal looks at is, okay, this is the implementation cost, this is the subscription and license cost, depending on the system that you're implementing, and this is the component for change management that we're gonna help you educate the business and the change processes and things like that. And when you wanna save money, that's the first piece you take out of the proposal. Say, no, nah, I don't need that. You know, I can, I can, I can deal with it, but, if you don't do it in the right way, I mean, man, the amount of grief that you have to go through two years subsequent to implementing a system because you didn't handle change management in the right way is, is immense. So I've been part of projects where that was the case, where the budget was, was quite tight and we had to make some tough decisions. And we said, okay, fine, you know, change management doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem to be such a big big lift and you know we can just do it ourselves and we've fallen flat and we ended up having like spending an, another year trying to fix it and getting people's buy-in and a lot of you know a lot of issues where in other cases where we've actually had change management as part of the actual implementation just 
how the, the two kind of compare is just insane. So it, it is so important to not forget that human aspect, communication aspect, when you're going through a system implementation, because people, you know, people can be resistant, people can be enthusiastic, you get different people's approaches to, to things. And that's why it's so important to just make sure that, that that's also factored in as you go through this journey of systems, you know, transformation or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And, and I mean, that, that point especially really resonates with me. And, you know, it's great that you brought it up because, um, you know, we really haven't had other guests talking about, um, you know, the change aspect of it. You know, and this is why we try to bring a variety of people on. So that way we can, you know, get all the different aspects of it. But, you know, when it comes to change, you know, I've worked on the, you know, the vendor side, the consulting side for, you know, for my entire career over here. And it's so easy to everyone just throws out the, oh, train the trainer. And then, you know, it becomes the customer's uh, problem to go and figure out how, you know, the uh, the end users go and, and adopt the system. And, you know, to your point, there can be resistance. And it's not just like resistance from somebody saying, I don't like this tool, but it, it could be a matter of, well, they're not trained in it. No one ever showed them the capabilities of it. They don't know is it better than, you know, the capabilities I have today? You know, no one ever showed me anything in terms of what this is going to look like. And, you know, and, and so, you know, change can be, you know, you could have a team of people, you know, just by themselves managing the change throughout the organization, you know, managing things like communication path and, and who is contacted at what intervals, you know, so having that type of vision um, and, you know, and, and just seeing the like, train the trainer as the line item on your on your statement of work of, you know, what what the consulting firm is going to do for you. You know, it, it's something where if you're not prepared to be able to manage that yourself, then that's something that you need to have a, a bigger plan in place for. Yeah. And I do think that probably around 80 percent of people being frustrated with systems is due to lack of understanding on how to use the system rather than there's something being wrong with the actual system, right? You know, it's like, the system doesn't work. This is a horrible system. I don't understand why you guys implemented this to begin with. It can't do any of the stuff that, that I thought it was going to do. And, you know, the majority of the time is really because people just don't know how to use it effectively rather than an actual issue with um, what you've implemented. Yeah. And, and I feel like it's always those people that, that have that, you know, uh, perceived resistance that in there that, you know, essentially the story becomes, oh, well, this person doesn't want to use the system instead of, hey, maybe there was an opportunity that, you know, or there might still be an opportunity that we have to kind of convert this person from, a, you know, someone who's resisting to someone who is embracing. And, you know, maybe I, I've seen some of the biggest proponents of systems being people who originally said, why do we need this? Like, we don't need this. We, we have a way of doing this. And then you start showing them the capabilities of the system and, and why it's better than what they currently have. And then they become some of the biggest, you know, leaders in the, you know, in getting it out there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So when, when it comes to, to change, like, like what are, uh, I guess, what are the key, the key things that you've seen that have kind of, you know, made it successful from a, you know, like, like, who, who are you involving in there at what steps of the, of the journey? Like, how are you ensuring that, um, you know, you don't have too many cooks in the kitchen in terms of everyone being involved from day one and, you know, voicing all, you know, separate and different opinions to everyone just kind of having knowledge of what's coming out and, and willing to embrace the technology. Yeah. So I think even before you start any implementation, you need to scope out the project. You need to understand what is required and you need to put together a project team, right? And that would be individuals or representatives from different areas of the business. You know, just putting that actual project team together is important before anything even gets started. And then subsequent to that, you also need to have a steering committee. So, you know, those kind of senior, if any escalations need to happen, that point of escalation, which is then a, like representatives also from across the business, but are really the ones that are making the go, no go decisions at the end of the day, or if there's any additional funding that need, that's needed to be able to do that. So that to me, just scoping out the project, 
project in terms of what the needs will be and who needs to be involved before anything gets started, I think is, is vitally important. Um, it also depends, you know, I've, I've been part of where you have purchase to pay implementations, obviously that you need to involve a lot more people because that is a complete culture shift in an organization going from, you know, automating purchase orders and payments to doing it, um, you know, manually, and it involves a lot of people. So then having different stakeholders across the business, because they are really the ones that's going to be driving that at the end of the day, making sure that they have buy-in up front, um, that that will be important. To implementing systems, I mean, we're going through um, a process now where we're doing a bit of a finance transformation, just looking at our at various systems, et cetera, and what it is that we need. Um, and, you know, we have people also, some people from the business, um, you know, mostly mostly in finance team, but also people from from the business. So I think it also just depends on the type of system that you that you're implementing. But just doing that initial analysis around who should be involved is important before you and making sure that people have the time to commit to it, right? Because you know, everybody doesn't stop their day jobs because you're implementing a system. They still need to do what it is that they need to do. So making sure that they have availability to be part of the project and if they can't be part of the project nominate somebody else that will be part of the project just making sure that that is also decided up up front and you have people that are really committed to it to make it work and, and drive the success the worst thing that can happen is you go you make a decision to implement it and then people say well i don't really have any time to spend on this you know and that's when things kind of fall flat so just having that commitment up front making sure people are available making sure you have the right stakeholders and just mapping it out and having those escalation points is is very important yeah no th there's definitely a lot of great information um you know from that where you know you want to make sure that accountability is there and you know the steering committee isn't there just to make sure that you know hey everything's running on time on budget whatever but you know being able to um, address things like, you know, hey, I need more IT support. And, you know, if you don't have someone from IT on the steering committee, then, you know, how are you going to ensure that, you know, extra resources are, are brought on from that standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that the team members have, you know, have the, the amount of time is, is crucial because, you know, you start seeing, you know, projects uh, might slip here and there or just take extra time in general. Um, and, you know, and, and, what happens is um, customer says, hey, I, we'll just take on some more stuff. Well, that's great. But if, you know, you guys are in close and you don't have time to go and take on more stuff yourself, well, how is it getting done? So making sure that not only you have that plan in place, but you have the right people to go and say, you know what, we're committed to this. So I'm going to make this person available. If that person's not available, let's figure out what our resourcing alternatives, you know, will be. Um, so yeah, no, those, that's, that, those are definitely great points. Have you seen, um, you know, just in terms of types of technologies, whether it's, you know, investing in ERPs, uh, you know, you mentioned planning tools, uh, you know, dashboards, things like that. Have you seen, um, you know, just better value and better, you know, ROI just from investing in, you know, certain types that, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to share the name of the, the, the tool, but just, you know, kind of like what what should people be looking at in terms of, um, you know, getting the most out of their investments? So I think it's a combination of things. So one is, so I'll kind of put it in two boxes. One are your kind of foundational type systems that you have, right? And then there's the decision support related activities that you either want to get from those existing systems or implement new systems around that. So that's really kind of being that decision support for the business analytics, predictive analytics, all those type of things. And then on top of that, you potentially have AI or you have uh, robotic process automation. Um, so I would kind of put it in those buckets. So in terms of just, I would say the foundational systems, I've always found that less is more when it comes to systems, right? Because if you implement one system that can do a whole bunch of different things, that is better for you from a cost efficiency standpoint because you don't have to hire a 50-person a corporate systems team to manage any 
you know, breaks if there's updates from the one and make sure that it talks to the other one or any un, like UI interfaces works well and all those type of things. So just having one system that does multiple different things to me has always been something that I would prefer. It's not always possible, but, you know, I, I would prefer that. And it's also easier from an information flow standpoint because it's very, it's harder for things in that information flow to break rather than if you have to do a batch upload or if it's a, you know, real time type of thing that happens. Um, so that's, that's the one thing. Um, then the other piece is just around predictive analytics. So a lot of things out there today, those foundational systems have transformed, I would say, in providing the capabilities of predictive analytics and providing you with more analytical tools. Um, scenario analysis planning is something that's fundamentally important just because of what's happening in the world today, right? Because the markets went crazy in 2020, 2021 with COVID and retail investing. Then the interest rates came, you know, people's behaviors, buying behaviors changed. So having the ability to take those kind of external factors and do some scenario analysis is extremely important to businesses because they know where they can stretch to, where they need to pull back, et cetera. So that next evolution of things to be able to get out of, you know, in an automated way and in a predictive way is fundamentally important. And then the last piece is just, you know, the artificial intelligence, um, robotic process automation. RPA has definitely accelerated over, you know, I would say the last 10 years. There's a lot of RPA being implemented in businesses just to eliminate um, manual processes and things like that. It's probably not gone as fast as I think it should have gone in terms of just because there is an investment required and people need to spend time to actually build the infrastructure. But as soon as it's in there, the stuff that it can do is just amazing. You know, taking three days worth of work and doing it in an hour um, and I've seen this like especially when you're doing analysis or anything like travel travel and expenses like RPA putting that over your process you know achieves a huge amount of of efficiency um, and insight as well and then obviously artificial intelligence on top of that really kind of you know using those large language models to do analysis and then you know spending the time to make sure that those analyses are what 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 it is that you want to get out of it and then kind of just reiterating from there until you get to a point where you are 100 percent comfortable but i've said this in other interviews as well like the one thing that that i just want to ai is great and i've used it i mean i communication and I'm, I, I love you know playing with chat gbt uh, and just it, it saves me a lot of time but especially when it comes to sensitive data sets, when it comes to financial, when you public company, it is actually more vital. But even a private company, to any financial analysis, you're exposing those large language models to a lot of sensitive data. And having the right governance and guardrails around that is fundamentally important. And making sure you have the right people to provide those guardrails are also important. So I do, I do think sometimes you know, there's an underestimation around the efficiency that AI creates because it only creates efficiency if you have the right infrastructure to support it. But, you know, if you can, if you kind of prioritize those things, I think, it, you know, if you don't use it in your business today, you're behind the curve. Like, I do think that eventually you're going to have to, everybody is going to have to you know, implement some type of artificial intelligence to drive some efficiency within the organization. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are, those are great points. And, um, I definitely want to talk, uh, you know, AI RPA with you. Uh, we could do that in a second here, but just, you know, bringing back to a point you made earlier about, you know, less is more when it comes to financial systems and being able to, you know, do more with fewer systems. I think a lot of companies get, um, caught up or hung up on, you know, they see a fancy demo from a, a vendor of like, hey, you need this product because it does this. And then they see another and they, okay, great, we buy it. And they see another fancy demo of a different product and they say, oh, we, we need that too, right? And uh, and they're not necessarily asking the right questions in terms of how am I getting the data into this particular system? Uh, you know, to some of your points from before of how do I make sure that this is governed, right? You know, do I have the right 
reconciliations and all of that in place to make sure that, you know, now we're sending data to 50 different systems. You know, it's not just a, are those systems, you know, achieving the vision I want, but, you know, is this creating a tangled web of infrastructure that we now have that we now have to, you know, make sure is all part of the, you know, part of the governance plan. Yeah. And also it, it gives you pricing power. Right. So not just from an ease of use standpoint, it gives you if you have a big system and a big implementation with one vendor, it gives you a lot of pricing power instead of spending 10 grand here, 10 grand there, 10 grand there. And, you know, at the end of the day, you're spending five hundred thousand dollars, but you're spending it with 10 different people rather than one five hundred thousand dollar contract with one person that you could push on you know, rates, you could push on getting some services for free, you could push on a longer hypercare time period. So there's also financial benefits, other than, you know, not having to, to hire a corporate systems team, but there's other financial benefits more from a procurement standpoint that it actually, you know, allows you to have. Yeah, no, that that's a great point. And I think I mentioned in our previous uh, episode over here, but you know, it, it's so easy to get hung up in the you know, pricing of this tool is 200 bucks a user. All right, 200 bucks is not too bad. Then it's 100 bucks per user for this other tool and $500 for this one. And before you know it, you know, to your point, you're spending half a million dollars, just, you know, $500 at a time or $200 at a time without even realizing where, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, now that everything's moved pretty much to the cloud, it's so easy to just say, okay, input your credit card over here. And now you have these capabilities versus, you know, versus those. So, you know, related to, uh, you know, I know you mentioned about RP RPA, AI, um, you know, uh, capabilities there, you know, where do you think, you know, companies should kind of invest resources from a, you know, just general automation standpoint of, you know, looking at, you know, uh, what, what should we automate? What can we automate? You know, what is kind of the process behind that? Yeah. I mean, I would really initially just tackle the low hanging fruit. When it comes to like, where, where does my team spend a significant, significant amount of time, but it adds very little value, right? So those are the things that I would try and hit first when it comes to seeing, okay, is there a possibility to then automate some of those processes so they don't spend that much time? And then you kind of move down that track of prioritization. Okay. What is, what is taking, you know, a lot of time, um, but is a little bit more value add, but is a lot more complicated to kind of implement. Or you could go the other way around too, just depending on the type of organization that, that you're with. But, um, you know, I would rather kind of start with a low hanging fruit because then you could actually move people's attention to the things that are more important. And it might take a little bit more time to implement automation there because maybe the impact is a little bit bigger just in terms of, you know, if you make changes there, the impact of the organization might be bigger. But then you have that time that they didn't have to spend on that to then effectively implement all the other things that they need to do that's really higher, higher impactful. Some businesses do the other other way around. They, they say, okay, fine, you know, what are the truly highly impactful things um, that my team is, is spending a lot of time on, let me prioritize that first. Um, and then I'll get to kind of the tail end of the stuff later. That that strategy works as well. It just depends on where you think from an over, overall value, from an overall organizational standpoint, you're going to have, have the most benefit. Yeah, and that, that's a great point. And, and even just from a what's going to get you the most buy-in too, right? Where, you know, maybe that two-week project that just goes and, and saves 10 hours of time, um, you know, might seem like, hey, that's not higher priority than the thing that's going to save hundreds of hours of time. But if you could get someone to say, hey, I'll commit to a two-week, you know, proof of concept of this, then, you know, that might be the best path for you of let's just do something really simple. We'll show that it can be done. And then we'll go and take this technology to some of the bigger problems versus others might say, well, it, you know, I, I don't really care if you're going to save me a thousand dollars a year on, on something. Uh, let's go and tackle saving me a million dollars a year. And then, you know, they want to start with that, you know, bigger, bigger project to get, you know, to get them interested in it. That's a very good point. I mean, I've I've definitely seen that play out. So, 
Yeah. Um, so re- regarding AI, I know, um, you know, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, using chat GPT to, you know, to save, uh, save time in many areas. Um, you know, I love just playing around with technology in general and, um, and all that just from, you know, answering emails. I have it right code and software for me, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I'm generally excited about AI. I know that AI is a very, there are people out there that love it. There are people out there that say it's the doomsday scenario going to kill us all. Right. Um, there's, uh, there's some people in between, but I guess you just don't hear, uh, as often from those people as, as the ones on each end of the spectrum. But, um, you know, I, I know you mentioned earlier about, you know, AI is something where companies are either going to have to, you know, invest in it or, um, you know, they're, they're going to get overtaken by, you know, competitors that, that are willing to, uh, to embrace in it. I guess just generally, like, like, what is your, what are your thoughts on, you know, on AI in general and, you know, just kind of bringing it into the, the finance function? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, I definitely think that it's going to make a significant impact to a lot of different areas within the business, including fin- finance. It has to be done in a responsible way. It has to be done with the right guardrails. Um, you know, in terms of where companies will fall behind is really around, you know, predictive type analytics that helps drive business decisions in a more effective way. You know, trends that we don't necessarily always focus on or see that could have a fundamental impact on a business decision or whether to engage with a client or whether to engage with a vendor and things like that. So those really kind of complicated data sets that people just don't do or or spend a lot of time on because it takes too long, but it provides insight. So, you know, those type of things, that's where I think it's really going to benefit businesses overall. Not really it's going to replace 100 jobs in my firm and I'm going to have all these cost efficiencies. It's really, you know, positioning people with the right tools um, and the right, I would say, um, information to make better decisions for the business long term. Companies that's not doing that today, it's not to say that they're going to completely crash and burn or anything like that. They're just not going to get those bigger deals or those better deals or those better customers or save money on vendor negotiations because, you know, there's some trends that have been pulled on a vendor offering pricing to different. They just going to, it's just going to take them a little bit longer to achieve and get to the same place as potentially other companies that are using it in an effective, in an effective way. I mean, we use it in, in our, in our company today in terms of, um, you know, if people have a question around a specific um, process or if people have a question around a specific policy, we have an AI bot that you go, well, what is our travel and expenses policy? And it just comes up rather than send out 50 different emails to people like, well, I want to book this flight and it's a six hour flight. And I don't know, can I fly business? Can I fly economy? Like, and, you know, it, it just eliminates those type of things. So we're starting to use it in our business a lot more, smaller scale as we kind of, you know, and responsibly, but as we as we become more mature in how to use it effectively, we're going to start expanding it across. Um, I was previously with NASDAQ. NASDAQ is starting to play with AI a lot more. They're starting to build it into their products. Um, you know, this is all public knowledge, by the way, so I'm not saying anything I'm not supposed to. But, you know, they're they definitely, you know, building it into their product set and, and, you know, Apex is doing exactly the same things you know, the same with a lot of other financial technology providers out there. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's important to understand when, you know, when it's coming to AI, you know, everyone now that's the hot topic of everyone wants to say, Hey, I have AI in my software. That's why you should buy it. Right. And, um, you know, there's a lot of understanding that, you know, kind of needs to come with it, but I think we're a little bit of my fear comes in with with ai um or just for lack of a better word is you know how do we ensure that you know the ai doesn't just become a black box of you know i'm just going to ask the ai hey can you create an analysis on you know should i do action a or action b should i invest in project a or project b what's going to return you know a higher roi and it's just going to go off behind the scenes and say oh you should do a right and and you say okay um, that's the path we're going to take versus understanding the underlying, well, 
why are you saying A is the better play? Like, like what is factoring in? You know, and a lot of these public AIs that are out there don't necessarily, you know, reveal here's my training data that I'm using and, you know, here's what, you know, we're basing decisions on. So, you know, how do we ensure that, you know, the governance isn't in place just from a I'm sending this but not that to the AI and making sure that, you know, sensitive data is not going there, but making sure that the use cases of it are being, you know, used in a way where, you know, here's what the output is, is going to be based on. Yeah. I mean, I do think you, you, you have to use it as a baseline, not necessarily, you know, your ultimate decision point, right? It's really there to provide at this point. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in 10 years, right? The world changes a lot in 10 years, but at this point, it's just providing your, well, the way that we use it is just additional insights to help make sure that we're making the right decision. But I would do, you know, if there's option B, C, and D, having those various type of scenarios and giving it the same, you know, information in terms of like, okay, if I go with option A, that's how much revenue I'm going to get. If I go with option B, that's how much revenue I'm going to get. And give it a whole bunch of decision points as well so that you kind of get, okay, this is a baseline of the data that it's giving me. All right, now, why do I want to do A? Why do I want to do B? What is the strategic? Because AI is not going to come back to you and say, well, that's the best strategic one you could do because it just just won't. So, um, like I said, I don't know, maybe you can do it in 10 years. But, you know, you still need that strategic aspect of it to come into play and that kind of human discussion points and things like that. So, you know, coming back to what I, like what I said a little bit earlier on, I don't think it's going to solve all your problems. It's just going to, it's going to help you potentially make different decisions based on the information that it provides you. Yeah. And faster decisions too, where, you know, the average company, you know, how long does it take to, to put together a budget um, and a forecast, right? And you have some companies that say, hey, we're, you know, we're cutting edge, we're doing quarterly forecasts, but, you know, you can go and, and have a system that, you know, that forecast could gen- be generated every single day, or, you know, it starts to see, um, certain trends in, in the market, in the economy, globally, whether it's wars, whether it's this, whether it's that, and be able to say, hey, here's, here's the impact that this is going to have to you um, versus having to put a team of people aside for two, three weeks to say, all right, now let's, let's go and, and redo our forecast based on you know, current market conditions. And I think we're going to see a lot more with, um, you know, right now, you know, we have several, you know, general AIs that are being used for different purposes. I, I think, you know, we're going to start to see, um, you know, ability for companies to kind of create their own um, AIs and, you know, their own training data sets and be able to, you know, make less of a black box, you know, of these tools. But, you know, um, I agree with you of, you know, that as an organization, you need to be looking at how are we using this? What is the intended, you know, purpose that we're trying to get out of this? And then, you know, is this something where we can rely on the AI if we are making sure that we're not just feeding in, give me the answer, you know, A, B, C, or D over here, but understanding, well, what are the driver, you know, what is making you say this so that you get that kind of transparency where it can be checked by, you know, by a, by a person. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, it's just allowing businesses not to be complacent, right. And not just accept that the way that we operate and the way that we're doing things is, is going to be the best way that we're going to do things forever and ever. Like if you don't, if you don't transform with the times and you become complacent, it's just, you know, it's just going to fall behind. You're not going to be competitive. You know, you're going to lose kind of a lot of other things. So you have to, you have to evolve as things evolve. If, if I put it that way, you know, regardless of what the trend is, I mean, I think, you know, a couple of years ago, ESG was the, the you know, a big topic of conversation. And I think it's still very relevant if it was applied in businesses in the right way. And they actually see a lot of benefits from it because it was deployed in, in, in the right way. There's some businesses, obviously, that took it a little bit more as like a money making play rather than actually, you know, putting as part of their strategy, I think artificial intelligence, blockchain, um, digital assets is is the same way. That's the way that the world is moving. And, 
you know, you can either embrace it and see how it's going to benefit you to the best of you, like within your business and, you know, capitalize on that, or you're probably just going to, you know, you're going to get left behind and not be competitive. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's, it's great that, that you mentioned it. I mean, you know, even just as it relates to ESG, you know, a lot of companies have gone overboard with it and, and, you know, and, and you have, uh, um, you know, now it's part of the, uh, the SEC filing requirements, um, to go and, and do it. So it's become more of a, a necessity for, for many businesses. But, you know, it used to be a, you know, Hey, I'm going to pay some guy to plant a tree to offset my travel costs for the month or whatever. And, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to search for, uh, I'll plant a tree in my backyard if someone's willing to pay me, but, uh, haven't been able to do that successfully. But, um, <laughs> so I know, um, I know we're coming up close to, to the end uh, over here. Any other, you know, I guess uh, nuggets of wisdom or anything that you want to, to share with, uh, with anyone watching, you know, maybe topics we haven't covered or, you know, maybe just follow on to ones that we have. No, I mean, the only thing I would like to say is, I mean, this is an exciting time for all businesses. You know, there's so much opportunity out there and there's a lot of eager people that you know want to be involved in transformational things with it within businesses and you know especially you know, generationally you can also see people are really keen to you know make a difference and and you know really drive impact in organizations and you can do that in, mul in mul multiple ways um, whether it be to come in and and automate and drive efficiencies and make things more efficient or you know just be you know, a part of making sure that the company still continues to have a right to win and doesn't become complacent, I think is, you know, exciting things to be a part of. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, it was absolutely great having you on the on the show today. I mean, I know that there's a ton of information that, um, you know, that you've been able to provide, which is, you know, always uh, much appreciated. And, you know, we'd love to uh, have you on again in the future to, you know, talk through uh, what things have changed and, you know, any other opportunities that, that exist out there. Great. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate it.